this is weird for those who have never been into a cuddle before. Um, this is going to be nothing like a normal cuddle, um, obviously. Um, and it's going to be a lot quicker because the most the, the normal cuddle is from 10 till 2 and that's for the beginner session and then from 2 till like 9 at night so there's we cover a lot we do a lot of uh, extra things but I'm pretty sure people don't want to be watching a computer screen for that long so uh, we're gonna be a few hours um, and also what what's happened over the last I guess month or so is that because I can actually sit at home all day every day I, I hopefully you can see I've been putting out more content more videos more trading pubs etc um, so a lot of what I tend to do is store a whole bunch of content and then release it at, at the cuddles hence why they're, they're quite long but we've seen a few bits and bobs so I'm just going to share my screen screen good -o. okay so before we go any further um, there are a few bits and pieces which I would deem to be um, critical viewing if you haven't already seen it. So I'm just going to add these to my watch later list. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, your videos. So if you haven't seen these, I would definitely um, watch the, the video why I'm bearish about house prices. I'd also um, watch... Um, in fact, for, for today, I think, yeah, the house price one will sort of add on, explain a little bit more. We're going to touch on property today very briefly, but I don't want to be pulled into a, a housing uh, debate, conversation, etc. So it's worth watching that 20 minute video if, um, yeah, if you're intrigued. Now, I opted not to do any slides today, and instead I opted to do, to do some doodles, and I did it on my... Um, Microsoft Surface tablet thing which has like a stylus thing and it looked beautiful on there well <laughs> it looks a lot better than the yeah because it has an actual inbuilt app but the whiteboard the Microsoft whiteboard has like a web version app and so it just looks a bit pants um, so apologies about that I didn't I thought it would cross over better but it doesn't matter um, so here we are um, what we're going to cover today is some big macro stuff and then I'll have a look, uh, a more in-depth look at my personal crash plan. Then we'll have a little trading exercise because I really want to show you um, the, I guess the 8 EMA bounce on the one hour chart. I think for most people here will be the most effective thing. I don't particularly want to show you the surge trading thing. Well, I mean, I, I will show you, but I, I'd highly recommend that you don't do the surge trading uh, method, which I do sometimes. I think... If you want to try and catch these sort of intra-daily moves, as in moves that happen over a couple of days at least, um, the one hour 8 EMA bounce is actually a lot better. Um, so we'll go through that. Then we'll talk. We'll have a break after that. So um, I'm just going to write this in. So uh, break. Oh, this looks really weird. Break. <clears throat> and then we will have an update, um, a bot update, and then a Q&A. So, yeah, and before we go any further, I just saw uh, as on the uh, on the ending to that Q&A with, uh, with the mentors, I saw, is it Bola? Da, 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 da. Yeah, so uh, Bola said, Syme says diversification is for idiots, lol. Um, and I just want, I really want to clarify um, that. So as I said in the chat box, um, it says, depends on your goals. D diversification basically means you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what market is going to boom or bust, and you're simply spreading your bets. In Warren Buffett's own words, if you know what you're doing, it makes no sense to diversify. So I have to, I just want to clarify that a little bit more. Oh, oh yeah, and John also then said, um, which was actually another Warren Buffett quote, Put your eggs in one basket and watch that basket very carefully. Um, so that's actually what Warren Buffett does. And so talking about diversification, if you look at businesses um, <clears throat> or yeah, bit like successful serial entrepreneurs, like um, famous ones that you, you know, Dragon's Den type people, what you'll find is that they don't diversify their businesses. They don't just set up a business 
um, and then go and set up you know 10 different businesses what they do is they set up a business they nail it they get it really really booming and that all they've done is they they've really concentrated on that niche or whatever they, they do like, like, look at James Khan he's focused on recruiting so he's set up a whole bunch of recruitment businesses he hasn't then gone and set up a, a crisp manufacturing firm or a online web design firm like he's stuck to his niche so he is effectively watch he's putting all his eggs in one basket the recruitment business niche um, and then then he's watching it very carefully and then what business owners tend to do is that when there is an incoming bullet or a bazooka to that basket they exit um, and so it's the same with investing uh, I guess um, and the thing is if you do go all in on one particular asset like property or crypto or whatever yeah you've got to watch it carefully and then you need to bug out um, and also be aware of different cycles so I just I mean that's just a quick explanation of that um, but yeah for the average Joe that doesn't want to active invest or keep it up to date you know yeah then screw it just put it in a tracker fund why not um, <clears throat> and I think if you look at the world's, I think one of the world's best trackers is BlackRock. Um, BlackRock Fund, I think. The one, I think it's been going on 20 odd years. Oh, one second, it's here somewhere. Products, view all funds. Ah. In fact, just a quick one. I'm, I'm just curious before we get into the big macro stuff. With a typical tracker fund, something like an S&P 500 tracker fund, what do you think the returns are every year averaged out over time. 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, 15%. Ten. So 4 to 5, 8, 15, 12. Yeah, so that's interesting. So most people are. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alex, good question. Net or gross? Net, by the way. Sorry, net. Gross is irrelevant. Hell, I've got a business that makes 95% gross margin. <laughs> Still shit. Uh, <laughs> Um, three, four, yeah, okay, that's better. Yeah, quite recently online, I've, I've come across people who, you know, obsessed with tracker funds, and I've asked the same question. They're all saying, oh, you know, 10, 10% net, you know, because they seem to think tracker funds, they track the stock market, which they do, sort of, um, and they produce similar returns to the stock market. Well, it's not the case when you took taking the big, um, big, uh, or if you look at the average of all funds, what you'll find is that the net result is something like anywhere between three to six percent per year. So they are not as good as you think. But yeah, for the average person, yeah, screw it, park your money, forget about it, and come back in forty years, and then you'll be happy. Um, and I think BlackRock, and also you'll find some funds they don't even show you. Or well, most of them are less than five years old. And some, uh, where, where's the biggest one? Let's. Just click on a random one. Uh, actually, uh, da, da, da. launch date 2017. Ignore that. I think it's actually I sh Black Rock iShares S and P 500. One second. I think it's this one. IVV. Performance. Come on. <clears throat> okay. Full dis performance. Okay, it's not showing. Okay, yeah, look at this. So after tax, post liquidation, etc., it comes to one hundred and sixteen point two percent, and I believe this fund was started in 2000 year 2000 so what that means is basically you do 116.2 divided by 20 years and that gives you 5.81 percent net average out over a decade um, which isn't that good um, but yeah so I was just so this is I guess is just responding to a, a previous question so okay let's um let's crack on with what the plan and the plan is to have a little chat with big macro first. So what I want to do, what I would like to do, is probably better English, is I am going to create a little notepad. Where is this notepad? <laughs> so 
Sorry, I've opened up a notepad, but I can't find it, and it's not on any of the screens. One sec. I think, ah, oh, here we go. That's on that one, and then we can open this. Cool. Yeah, I'm gonna move things around one second, and so we don't read ahead. So, again, apologies for um, this, the crappy font. It looked great on my tablet, but yeah. So, okay, big macro. Let's crack on. Um, sorry. Eventually, I'm gonna get my shit sorted. Okay, so the. I always find when whenever I'm confused about what's happening in the world, I I go back to basics. I, I look at everything with the first principles thinking, um, and I guess history tends to um, it really does guide us if if you look at history properly. And a lot of people when they look at history, they go back like fifty years and go, "What's the market done for the last fifty years?" or or whatever. Um, but really, you need to go back several centuries to really understand big, big trends. And so I went back quite far <clears throat> in history um, a few weeks ago, and I was just trying to figure out how the hell have we ended up in a world like we're in right now, uh, and what, what has led us to there. And it, I guess it all starts to, I guess, what humans have been doing for thousands of years, which is war. And then when you look at why nations go to war, I mean, we've had massive wars, you know, England against France simply because the kings hated each other. You know, sometimes some a king would send like something through the post, like a dead, like a severed head or whatever. And then it's like, right, that's it, we're at war. So sometimes they're over silly things like that. And it's all ego and pride protection. But most of the time, most wars have been about resources and power. So whether it's, geo and when I say power, um, I'm including geo <clears throat> geopolitical positioning there. So um, whether it's, you know, Constantinople, you know, trying to own Constantinople, which is like, I think, modern day Istanbul, that was like the, the central pivot point in, in the Roman Empire from, you know, from Romans into the East. Um, so like stuff like that. So that's when I, what I, say, I mean by power, but really it's about resources. <clears throat> so if we accelerate through history a bit and then let's take, I guess, wars over the last couple of hundred years. Um, so a country has a whole bunch of resources and another country wants it. So what happens? They wage war and it's expensive. It's expensive in terms of human life. Lots of life is, is lost and it takes years. It takes years and years and years and years. Um, they may win um, and both countries, as in the power, political parties or the, the, the kings or whoever's um, controlling the strings, their, their power in their own country is also affected sometimes. Like sometimes the, their own public will go, why are we in this stupid war? We don't understand why we're at war, blah, blah, blah. Um, and what you'll find with crime and also, I guess, yeah, war is like an elevated sort of crime effectively. And when you look at crimes, what you'll find is that as a person or a group of people, or hell, even a country, it becomes more sophisticated, guess what happens? The levels of sophistication in crime also goes up. So I guess if you look at the, the lowest level of crime, it will be pickpocketing on a street of some sort. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, yes, there involves a lot of skill with pickpocketing. You've got to you know, know what... You know, sleight of hand and you know padding people down and you know bumping into people so yes there is an element of skill just like if you were to make horseshoes I know at a foundry like not a foundry you know banging those horseshoes etc yes there's a lot of skill in that but it's, it's not very sophisticated you're effectively bending hot metal into a particular shape um, and so as crime gets more sophisticated, you get into, you go from, I don't know, pickpocketing into frauds or scams of some sort. Um, you know, like the Nigerians emailing everyone saying, hey, you won the lottery, give us your money, um, that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and then it goes up and up and up. And eventually crime gets so sophisticated that the, the average person hasn't got a freaking clue what's going on. And I think we're, <clears throat> we're all enlightened I mean, especially if you're in this Zoom chat, you, you're all pretty aware of, you know, 
what goes on in the banking sector somewhat. And so I guess modern day crime, the, the highest level of sophistication is, um, you know, it could be tax evasion, you know, going through BVI, British Virgin Islands, etc. I mean, if you ever wondered why the UK is such a powerful and influential player in the global scene, even though we are a tiny net island, it is simply because we are the best money launderers on the planet, as in the UK. Look at every country on the planet. If you look at the chart of um, percentage of people that are accountants, <laughs> um, the UK is a, a clear winner. No one comes near us. Um, <clears throat> and we invented... So when, and, and you have to understand, when the UK started losing power on a global, I guess, strength, you know, as the US started growing, Germany started growing, Japan, you know, all these big old nations started, you know, I guess it was the downfall of the British Empire. As we started downfalling, or falling down, so to speak, um, we pivoted. And so we pivoted into facilitators, we pivoted into um, how to effectively dodge tax, um, which is why we created the B British Virgin Islands and all these, you know, the Cook Islands and stuff like that, which is why all the world's money basically flows through the, the, the city of London. That's why it has its own. Yeah. So that's one way that the UK has remained in power. And so all I'm trying to say is that the, the sophistication in crime has got so sophisticated that the average Joe, the average journalist hasn't got a freaking clue. You could put it right in front of their face and they wouldn't have a clue, even though it is in our face and it's the private central banking system. So the central banks as it is right now is 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 way up there. It's, it's so sophisticated that it's actually, you know, that these private entities can create currency out of their ass and enslave people into debt. Like every time a government takes out, you know, it, it tries to expand the currency supply, it puts the country in debt. I mean, that's crazy. So what happened is countries or uh, mid, I guess sophisticated entities, I'll just say entities because it's not necessarily, necessarily a country, it could be a group of people. Um, they found that there is a better way to go to war with a country instead of sending troops and that is via debt so <clears throat> this is a recent development i guess over the last couple of hundred years um and especially since the 1950s especially so mandatory reading here is uh, the confessions of an economic hitman if you haven't already read that um if you have read it i would get the new updated edition and then read that again um and so <clears throat> for those that haven't read it what what happens is that they can go to war with a country, strip it of all its resources without sending a single troop over. So if I get Microsoft Paint out, because I don't want to doodle on this silly whiteboard app thing. I'll go back to my trusty old software. So what happens is that you have a big country over here, I'll call it big, and then you have a small country over here, well, when I say small, let's just say developing. And in these countries, you have basically um, they they tend to be dictators. They let's just say dictator, okay. And what happens is the big country sends over economic hitmen. And when I say economic hitmen, they are simply economists. Economists and analysts and what happened and by the way this is all fact like nothing here I'm saying is kooky Illuminati um, stuff it's like this is fact I'm, I'm I will tell you when something is a bit gray gray area and what happens but and so these economists they, they go to the dictator and go hey we've done a massive study of your we've covered we've traveled all over your country blah 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 currently you don't have uh, infrastructure, you don't have oil plants, you don't have good train tracks, you don't have bridges, hydroelectric dams, all that sort of stuff. If you had all of those stuff, your GDP over the next 20 years will go through the roof. Um, it would solidify your, your position as dictator or, you know, control of this country. Um, would you like it? And then the dictator goes, um, sounds good, but 
um, I can't afford it. Oh, it's fine, it's fine. Um, so what happens is, I don't know, just pl pluck a, you know, so, so what happens is the big country go, oh, don't worry, um, we've got really good um, connections to a central bank, let's call it the Federal Reserve, and they're happy to loan you $500 billion. So let's take $500 billion, debt, which effectively they're indebted to the big country. And then what happens is the $500 billion gets credited to the bank account of the dictator. Now, what will happen is that a dictator will then sk um, top skin um, off the... I mean, they, this person may take a billion dollars and put it in his or her personal bank account. Or I say not her, him. It's always a him. Um, so they'll... That, and that's why you see a lot of these... The, the families and extended families of these dictators are extremely rich. Because what they do is they take this big old loan, they skim, you know, off the surface. And then what they'll do is they'll plow, I don't know, um, so one second, companies, um, companies, by the way, and all these companies are, if not owned and run by the same people or have very strong uh, uh, connections to. And so what ha then happens is the money, let's say 499 billion, <laughs> goes to these companies to build the hydroelectric dams, the, the nuclear reactors, the, the roads, the like freaking everything. 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever, whatever you know the country wants. Because the dictator has been sold on the dream that, you know, if 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 you do all of this, your your GDP is going to increase, which means your your cash flow is going to increase, which means your own personal wealth is going to increase, you'll be re-elected, all that sort of stuff. And you'll pull out, you'll single-handedly pull out your country out of poverty into a developed nation. The dictator can go on the news and say, hey, I'm gonna, I've just reinvested massively into the country. Uh, we want to bring the poor people out of poverty, blah, 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 blah. Um, pop, you know, this person gets really popular. Uh, but guess what happens? This is the, the sophistication of this con. $499 billion has gone to big companies and these big companies are going to go to that country and build, okay? These big companies are going to have a freaking shitload of margin. But what's happened? All of a sudden, this small country is now a bitch to the big country because it's in debt. It's got a $500 billion dollar loan, uh, debt. And guess what? That money never left, let's say, I'm just going to call this the US. <laughs> um, that money, that $500 billion really never left. It never left the United States. And these big companies will be BP, um, Shell, there'll be, um, you know, there could be Pharma, it could be Glaxo, it could be, um, oh God, there's loads of names. I can't remember. There's loads of uh, big um, industrial companies here, which are, their names elude me. <clears throat> and so they all make big profits. The money actually stays in the US because yes, they got a, you know a 500 billion. The 500 billion dollars is sent over to the dictator, but really all they just did is opened up a a bank account for them, which was still sat in you know not on the Fed. It could just be you know what will actually happen is the central bank won't actually do that. It will then be facilitated by the primary lenders. So let's say Goldman Sachs. So they'll be opened a Goldman Sachs account or JP Morgan or whatever like that. So does everyone understand this uh, uh, effective con and how that this is modern day war? This is except what's happened. So remember, if, if a country invades another country with troops and soldiers and planes and tanks, what happens? You, ha you, you take over the country, you have to get, get rid of the, you know, the, the, the dictator that was in it. You have to then, you'll probably end up battling their own civilians, etc. Everyone hates you because you're the aggressor, you're the invader. And yes, you got all of their commodities and res resources, but everyone hates you and it's a bit of a shit show. This is a far better way because what happens is you've effectively, you now own the country via debt. You now have access to all of their resources because you've, because the, the country itself has simply opened up its arms to BP, Shell, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, it's modern day warfare. So if we're looking at the next couple of targets, guess what? I think North Korea is the next prime target. 
Um, I don't know whether Kim Jong Un is fat, um, not fat, sorry, um, dead or alive. Um, I think it says he's alive. Um, even though I heard it, yeah, I, I don't, I don't care. But if I was Kim Jong Un, what I would do is, yeah, actually, I would open my arms up. Remember, he runs a big old dictatorship here. He's got the, he's actually North Korea is the has the most amount of natural resources on the planet by a country mile in terms of rare earth minerals. Um, so, if if I wanted to cement my position on the global scene and also in my own country, if I was King Jong Un, I would simply it's either going to be uh, I'm either going to be forced to have a couple of nuclear weapons rammed down my throat or I can open up my arms make myself super rich and then do all this and guess what the US will do they would lovingly do this <laughs> um, and so yeah um, so I just saw USA worked out after Korea and Vietnam that wars weren't necessarily the best option yeah correct Vietnam even though it was technically a draw was actually a massive loss um, for the US um, so yeah over the last 50 odd years, this form of war has been insidious. So, now some of you are probably thinking, Simon, I'm here for a, a, the realistic trader cuddle. Why the hell are we talking about modern day war? This is everything. This is, this is everything to do with what's happening right now. If you understand this, you'll understand what's happening right now. So, <clears throat> let's move away from proxy wars and stuff like that. Um, the yeah oh by the way let's just oh by the way guess what happens there is an ultimatum here there is an ultimatum and the ultimatum is let's say so that is the plan let's just write down um, oops the plan But what if the country, the dictator, says no? <laughs> oh, okay. There's a little uh, hiccup in in the in the plan here, guys. So this is when, again, this is not conspiracy stuff. This is fact. Like this has happened dozens of times. What happens is the big country, let's say the U.S., goes, "Oh, hi, CIA. Um, we have a slight hiccup. There is a rate. We need a regime change." because they're not playing ball, um, come up with some bogus things, uh, weapons of mass destruction, which we now know for a fact never existed and was fabricated, stuff like that. So what happens is CIA conducts a regime change. Again, this is all in the, the book uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Um, they then put in a puppet, and then the puppet accepts the deal, accepts the plan. So that that's what happens. Um, They tried it with Cuba, actually, not long ago. The Bay of Pigs. Their plan got foiled, though. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... Yeah, and, and by the way, the moment... So Libya was the last one, actually. Libya, by the way, was the last regime change. It happened all of a sudden, very, very quickly, because Gaddafi was about to set up the, the, the gold dinar, which would have been a global gold... Uh, a Middle Eastern and African-backed... Um, or pooled gold um, currency, the gold dinar. Anyway, what happened, they did a regime change very fast, except it wasn't just CIA doing um, smoke and mirrors type stuff, they actually sent in troops, we actually bombed the shit out of them. Um, they put in a puppet, and guess what, the very next day that Gaddafi was killed, they set up a central bank and took in, I think it was a $200 billion loan, straight away. Um, and then, yeah, so that plan, so Libya is now a debt slave to the US, uh, as we speak. Well, actually, not just the US. France had a big, big, um, big say in that as well. France took a big chunk out of Libya. Right, let's get <clears throat> away from the crazy stuff because I know this seems crazy, even though it's factual. Um, and yeah, as John says, oh, and Davinda, yeah, correct. Invade and install a central bank, then accept the plan, yep. And then it's all in the case of democracy, you know, yes. Totally agree. Okay, so step two. We're now present day, <clears> or <throat> well, let's go back a bit. 
So we have the panic of 1909, and what happened pre-1909, or oh, by the way, up in, like, 1909 was the biggest crash in human history. Um, as in, um, okay, in terms of broad markets, okay, obviously we have, ident you know, we have, um, when I say things like that, I, I, I need to be more clear, because the tulip mania of 1636, that was technically the biggest bubble, etc. But that was just a tiny little thing, you know, a tiny um, tulip of the Viceroy variety sold for the equivalent of two million quid in today's money. Um, two million uh, dollars, not for sterling. So that obviously is a big um, bust and fail, and you got, you know, South Sea bubble, etc. But when I say the, um, the 1909 panic was the biggest <clears throat> crash in its time, I meant of global, uh, sorry, of a of a broad market like the S&P 500, etc., or whatever the equivalent was at that time. Now, during the 1909 panic, um, a lot of people, or the public back then, hated central banks as much as the public are starting to figure out right now. And they, they caught, there was massive outrage. People losing their jobs, the economy went into the gutter, and they forced the government to ban central, private, privately owned central banks because it was against the constitution. So I made this massive coffee and it's been sat here for ages. I need to drink it before it gets horrible. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, this is a bit of a, a random one. Um, I spit test everything because I'm a weirdo and I realized that the coffee machine down in the kitchen, I can make a coffee, but it will go, it will go cold or not palatable uh, within about 10 minutes or so. And then so I started <laughs> tweaking with different temperatures. And now what I do is I, I've got this little bullet blender thing and I put all sorts of rubbish in it. But um, I boil the water now on the pan and then do it. And then the, the coffee stays hot for a good 40 odd minutes. It's weird, I don't, I don't understand that. Maybe it's because of the, the oils and stuff inside it get hot, but I literally boil coconut milk and water and then, yeah, anyway. So th I've had this for ages. I'm always doing weird stuff. <clears throat> okay, 1909, this, uh, the public hated the central banks and they got banned and they tried to fix everything. And then what happened, again, so more crucial reading is the creature of Jekyll, Highland, um, Jekyll Island. I've mentioned that before. It's absolutely fascinating. It's one of the books that really got me into global uh, or big macro, so to speak. <clears throat> and what happened is that all the richest people on the planet um, back in back then, in nineteen, uh, I think it was nineteen eleven, they they met in an island um, called Jekyll Island, and the basically it was the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, Senator Aldrich, uh, all all of the big names back then. It was a bit like having a private meeting and Bezos, Musk, Gates, all the world's billionaires that you can think of were invited in secret to construct a new paradigm shift of some sort. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's a 24 hour long audio book, by the way, so you need to listen to it at times two speed. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's many dog walks of listening. So <clears throat> what happened is that they came up with a new banking system and the, it was it was, it was in, interesting, and they had to do this all in private because if the public knew that the foxes were gathering together to construct a new chicken coop, chicken shed, you know, the public wouldn't like it. So that, that's exactly what they were. They were foxes all collaborating to come up with a new fancy, even more sophisticated version of a chicken shed, but, they con but the foxes controlled the security. So, and what they came up with is what we now know as the Federal Reserve. So they went to Congress and they tried to um, launch the National uh, uh, Federation. I think it was the National Federation Association or something like that. Uh, fan they, they, yeah, the National, something like that. And they got laughed. They, they, they got laughed out of Congress. It was, it was basically rejected. And they kept doing it for two more years. And in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created. And back then it didn't have all the powers as it did, as it does now. But what they've been doing, if you again, if you read that book, you'll see the progression over time. But every now and again, a new act would be passed and the Federal Reserve will get, will get more powers, more powers, more powers, more powers. And then it would basically get to the point where, uh, let's 
So I'm just trying to find it so you can all. Um, so I'll just type creature of J. It's on YouTube. If you type that in in YouTube, you'll see the, the author reading it out. And then you can listen to it at times two speed. So I'm just trying to find something. Yeah, so if you go to this, um, <clears throat> where is it? So in the course, hopefully you've all seen this by now, I think it's in level one, it's the global financial system Ponzi scheme. And it's where I talk about the, the vampire, the giant vampire squid. Oh, through pay That one, okay. So this is where you need to then start reading about um, the vampire squid. So or just watch this video. That explains that bit. So that way we can move on. Um, whiteboard. Oh, come on. Here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that. Then we need to talk about this. Whoopsie daisy. Yeah. So that whole bit is that video there. That'll explain it a little bit more. And now we need to under, uh, understand inflation and deflation a bit more. Now, I've explained this in the past, but I, it's, it's a question that regularly pops up, so I wanna cover it again. So let's just get rid of all of these doodles. <clears throat> so you have to understand that there are two types of inflation and deflation. You have price, so let's... Um, So you have two types. You have price inflation or deflation, and you have monetary inflation or deflation. So the easiest way to rem remember this is price inflation is when goods, as in the price that you know the the the, the price of um, that goes up or down. Okay. So if your milk is now suddenly more expensive, that's price inflation. Or if it goes down, that's price deflation. So that's the simple thing. That's what the public sees. So I guess um, a way to look at it is that this is what the public sees and this is what the higher power sees. So monetary inflation or deflation is effectively the currency supply. Um, so yeah, if they expand the currency supply, that's monetary inflation. If it starts contracting and people start defaulting or paying off debt, that's currency deflation. Um, or monetary deflation. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, yeah, so and that's that. So, I just saw a question um, from Davinda M2, uh, M1, M2. So, M. So, the way that you look at your, the monetary supply is, is is done in four metrics. So, it's M0, M1, M2, and M3. So, M0 is all base hard cash. Um, so, literally, the physical cash out there. M1 is is M0 plus all um, checking accounts, so as in your bank accounts, etc. M2 is M0 plus M1 plus other forms of um, debt, so I think it includes things like credit cards, etc. And then M3 is the broadest base, uh, is the broadest um, money out there. What happened in 19, no, 2006 is, is either 1996 or 2006, the Federal Reserve stopped broadcasting M3. Um, and M3 is actually, because it's the biggest, broadest number of credit out there, they just stopped doing it. They said it was, it was irrelevant, no one needed it. But we do need it because it's, a, it's basically showing us, you know, how bad the monetary supply is increasing. Um, so, yeah. So hopefully that makes sense to Binder. Um, when the government talks about monetary supply, um, they're talking about M2. Because another reason why they don't declare M3 is because 
most central banks have a public and a non-public balance sheet. Um, <clears throat> I think they actually call them dark money, which is <laughs> it's quite ominous. You know, you have matter and dark matter, um, and there's public um, public balance sheet, and then the dark money balance sheet. And so, if you were to have a look at that M3 number, um, so if, if you were to have another, oh my lord, I'm just going, I'm going off on one here. Uh, if you had a chart, M0 would be like this. M1 will be like this, M2 will be like this, and M3 will be like that. It's it's ridiculous. And, and that's because um, a lot of M3 is part of the dark money, I what the Fed is doing behind the scenes and not behind the scenes. So, um, Reese, why is it that most economists don't know about the IMF SDR? It's not in the syllabus. That's it, remember, um, modern day academia is all about passing the exam. And what happens in schools and universities these days? It's like, okay, well, we will teach you what's in the exam. <laughs> as simple as that. Um, I know that's especially with schools, maybe not so much with universities, depending on the degree, obviously. Um, <clears throat> if you're talking about theoretical astrophysics, etc., I'm sure they don't, you know, they're, they're talking about everything. But if it's, yeah, for like economics or a money module in economics, they will literally just teach you what you need to pass the exam. So, yeah. So anyway, I need to get away from the uh, Q and A bit. I'll do that later. I need to get through the content first, then I'll, I'll backtrack through the questions. So this is inflation and deflation. Now, everyone happy? Before we go any further, everyone happy with the difference between price and monetary inflation deflation? All you need to remember is price inflation is prices of stuff going up and down. Monetary inflation or deflation is the currency supply. Okay, happy? Show a thumbs up. We'll type yes. Okay, I've seen a few yeses, good, let's get rid of this. Now, the thing, so here's the, here's the crux. Every country in the world, or every government in the world, is piling on debt. We all know that. Every country in the world owes debt, owes money to every other country, and every other country owes money to the IMF, effectively, or, or to China. <laughs> um, there's that joke, you know, everyone owes money to America, but who owns America? China. Oh. <laughs> um, but it goes a bit further than that. So piling on debt. Now, all these economists, all the people running the country, they know the beauty of compounding interest. And so this is why if you hear in the news the 2% figure, every country in the world is looking for the Goldilocks zone of 2% inflation. And the reason for 2% 2 inflation is because effectively, over time, a lot of the country's debts will be evaporated away through inflation because they're simply earning more. Remember, yeah, because if a country's GDP grows by 2% per year every year, eventually you get into the, the point where um, it's exponential. So if you take human gro population growth, that's 1.8% per year growth, and we're in exponential growth. And so debt is nominal. So if a country owes a trillion dollars, okay, well it owes a trillion dollars. But if over time their economy grows by 2% a year, 2% a year, what happens is that this debt effectively gets evaporated away over time. Um, or the the repayment schedule to service that $1 trillion debt is no longer as onerous as it used to be. As in, it's no longer a massive chore um, as it used to be. Um, so that's, yeah. <clears throat> so that's one thing. Now, here is the thing. Every government on the world is terrified. I want to use a different color. Dark red. Terrified of deflation. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions. Some of you could probably answer this. I just want to check. Now, first question. What type of deflation are they worried about? Price deflation or monetary deflation? Say in the chat box if you think you know. Good, yep. <clears throat> most people put in monetary deflation, correct. So, most governments are terrified of monetary 
deflation. Now, why are they terrified of money deflation? <clears throat> Have a guess. <clears throat> okay, some of you got there, sort of. Yeah, so David, George is the closest so far. Longer time to pay their debts. Chris Faraday, yep, get in there. Uh, can't grow the GDP, yep. Interest on debt increases, yep. Okay, these are all pretty much there, thereabouts. Um, <clears throat> and it's all because debt is nominal. And this is so crucial. Absolutely crucial. Remember this. Whoopsie. Debt. Oh my God, that's not a D. <laughs> um, oh my Lord. I guess let's go back. D-E-B-T is nominal. Okay, this is essential. If you remember nothing, remember debt is nominal. And what debt, what this means is that a debt, in, in, in simple English, a debt is a debt. What, which means, so I'm, I'm going to keep on saying which means, which means, and, and try and break it down even more. So debt is nominal, which means a debt is a debt, regardless of what's happening in the world. So, for example, if country A owes one billion dollars to country B, that country owes a billion dollars, regardless of what ha happens. So if, if A enters nuclear war with another country, it doesn't matter. A still owes B a billion dollars. Um, <clears throat> so that's what nominal, that's what, it, that's what I mean by a debt is a debt. It's regardless of everything else. So if A enters massive inflation, guess what? All of a sudden, like that billion dollar debt can be paid off very quickly. So we all hear lots of, you know, bad things happening in Zimbabwe during their hyperinflation. But what we, what we don't hear is uh, of the thousands of people that made an absolute freaking fortune out of the Zimbabwe hyperinflation. What you don't hear are the people that had a mortgage on a house or shitloads of land. And then in the space of a week, their whole mortgage was, they were able to pay it off like in, a, you know, in 10 seconds worth of work um, and stuff like that. So that's why it's a double-edged sword. Inflation is great for debt repayment, but it's not good for your whole economy. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit like, I don't know, um, I guess, let's say you need to be super focused on something. It's like taking a massive shot of heroin, or I don't know, I think you sniff it. I've never taken drugs. Um, the And yeah, all of a sudden, that person's gonna be super focused and super on alert. So for a task, that person will be, you know, on, on their, his or her A game, but cocaine is really dead, deadly to the body. So it's a bit like that. So the reason I'm just going to, hopefully that makes sense so far. Now, here's a real life example. In the 1929 Great Crash, nominal, nominal income fell by 53%. So income fell by 53%, which was just ridiculous. So let's just make it easy to call it 50%. So what this effectively meant is that the country itself was earning less than 50%. People themselves were earning less than 50%. So let's take a, <clears throat> a person, let's break it down even clearer. Let's say a person back then was earning, oh, maybe not then, let's say it happens now, okay? And we have deflation and all, all uh, um, variations of it and let's say you're earning two thousand dollars a month and you have um, I don't know I guess the average person probably have a fifteen hundred dollars a month of debt 
But what happens if nominal income falls by 50%? Ah, shit. So at this, in this scenario here, you, you've got $500 a month spare or positive. If all of a sudden, so that's one example, if income falls by 50% now, you're taking home $1,000 a month, but what is your debt? A debt is a debt. So you still got 1,500 quid a month of debt servicing to, to finance. So now you're minus 500 quid a month. Uh, yeah. So that is the scary thing. I mean, we're all sort of, most of us in the UK right now are sort of experiencing this um, with our furloughing. I would say, no, no, obviously everyone here is different. Some people are, are you know, quids in due to all of this. But if you look at the masses, so 90% of the population, like most of us have been furloughed on 80% income. So all of a sudden, we are experiencing a, a tiny abstract form of, of deflation or income deflation. So now all of a sudden, everyone's had a 20% pay cut. Um, which is hurting a lot of people, which is why we're having all sorts of failures um, in in the broader system. But yeah, so and this this is why governments are terrified because all you need to do is just instead of remove you know having a thousand, let's say they have a, you know all of a sudden let's take the US, they've got twenty trillion dollars in GDP and what do they have? I don't know, something like I don't know what they're they're, they're <clears throat> Uh, per year, let's say. What is their national debt right now? Um, I don't know, I'm guessing 22 trillion. In fact, we can figure out. I haven't looked at this. Um, what is it? US debt clock. There's all sorts out there. Here we go. National debt. 24. Oh shit, it's gone up. <laughs> um, Jesus Christ. It was 22 the last time I checked. So. Ah, oh, look at this down here, money creation. M2 is what they're, yeah, you'll never see M3 anywhere. But M2 is what they're looking at. So they're saying that the money supply is $17.3 trillion. Uh, um, but yeah, look at their national debt. So that's pretty much almost $25 trillion. So in this example, the US is making $20 trillion a year in GDP. No, they're not, that's wrong. But yeah, so, all I'm trying to say is that the governments are in the same boat. Every government owes shitloads of debt to the central banks. <clears throat> and if deflation happens, bad shit happens. Um, so, yeah, and Devinda, so with hyperinflation, the value of the money reduces, correct? Um, one second, so I'll just. Oops. So everyone understanding the, the why everyone's scared of debt to deflation so far? Yeah, cool. And so the graph looks like this when you look at currency printing. Oh dear. So, so this is value and this is um, supply of a currency. So as the currency supply goes up, <clears throat> the value, the purchasing power of that currency goes down. Um, so that's what it looks like. Except in real life, the chart is like, we and we. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, debt is easier to pay off um, during hyperinflation or big inflation. Um, but uh, yeah, you're, you um, what was the Devinder said? Debt easy to pay off. Actually, price equals money. Debt equals currency. Yeah, um, but you. <clears throat> but there's a thing called the Cantillon effect. So here's the here's, here's something else. Um, Cantillon effect. So this is why governments like inflation to begin with because let's say in my room right now I've got a money printer behind me and I printed out a hundred billion no no something bigger I printed out five trillion pounds of 50 quid notes <laughs> oh no, no I wouldn't I'd never be able to spend that I, I just put 50 tri uh, five trillion pounds in my bank account now that five trillion pounds in my bank account like 
has all of the purchasing power of, of modern day pound sterling because it hasn't entered the currency supply yet. So what I can do is effectively, I can go on a massive spending spree tomorrow or Monday morning. I can go on a massive spending spree and buy everything I want in the shortest period of time possible. And my $5 trillion would have, you know, modern day purchasing power. I can buy whatever I want at current prices. But the second that $5 trillion starts sprinkling over into the economy, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden the currency supply is going to go shoot up because it's now in the economy and the value is going to shoot down. So I have the full effect of all of that printed money, but the, the, the economy doesn't. Does that make sense? Because that this is where so some people get confused with that they think that you know yes inflation you know the currency supply goes up but you know the dollars are worth a lot less so it sort of equals out the you know the debt repayments but it doesn't it's due to the Cantillon effect um, and it's because if you print it at, at at source you have the full power of it because you are the first let's say you're the first order mover of it and then the second you start spending it let's say I buy a hydroelectric electric dam for five billion dollars or pounds that dam manufacturer has gets the money and then they'll then start spending it so they'll then be the second order spenders so to speak um, but their five billion dollars won't be able to buy as much as it used to because obviously the current supply has got up so that is why everyone is terrified of deflation so this is where we need to move into um, something else now. And this, oopsie daisy. We need to move over into the typical process of a crash. So this is the more juicier stuff. Everything I've just been talking about recently is um, foreplay, so to speak. So <clears throat> we have four events. So what I've come up with is four things which, which what happens. So if we zoom in to here, we don't need, there we go. So <clears throat> first of all, we have the shock. And this is, I guess, my four stages of a crash uh, or four stages of the typical crash based on my understanding of um, crash history. So what happens is that there's some sort of big black swan event or some big external trigger of some sort. Um, <clears throat> could be world war, it could be a pandemic, it could be whatever. Um, one second, just need to finish the coffee. <clears throat> so the trigger triggers something. And this is basically what happens. Um, so the government goes, so I'm just, uh, one second. So effectively, the government goes, oh, no need to panic, it's nothing, nothing to see here, which is pretty much what they always do. Mainstream media <laughs> says, yeah, what, what they said. All they do is they just, um, <clears throat> they com compound what, what was said. Um, social media goes, yeah, what they said, but slightly sensationalized. And the public are completely ignorant and they carry on as usual, nothing happened. Like for us, oil going to negative $37 a barrel, that was a huge, huge economic event for us. As traders, we're like, Jesus, Musk, um, th like that was a nuts move. But like if I, mean, I told my wife, and my wife was like, mm, I don't really understand what that means. And then, <clears throat> yeah, her friends didn't know either. And I was like, yeah. So long story short, most people didn't, still don't have a clue what happened with oil. They just think, oh, oil, well, whatever. It was in the news for about a millisecond and then, then it was gone. <clears throat> Alternative media, and they're probably, you know, oh, this could be something to worry about. And then they'll start digging in. And here's what happens with the markets. So the markets rally in anticipation of a sell-off. <clears throat> and that's because the big boys are like, shit, we need to sell off. Okay, how do we get people wanting to, to sell? Let's create a big rally. And then, yeah. So there's all sorts of shenanigans going on with the markets. I've covered that in other videos. <clears throat> and yeah, smart hands dump assets to the uninformed, naive public. So they create a bit of a rally, the public come rushing in. Um, look at Tesla going from like 400 to seven or 800 dollars very quickly. I, I think that was a smart dump effectively. Um, <clears throat> small businesses, yeah, 
business as usual. Big businesses, yeah, most of them carry on as usual, but some of them, the smart ones, start raising capital very, very quickly. And here's something which interested me. So Tesla, capit um, one second, raise. I'm just trying to do a quick Google search. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so, one second. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Another two billion. Well, I can't. What was the last, the latest figure? I think this is a pure masterclass what happened here. I can't remember. I can't find the exact figures. But basically, in January, um, Elon Musk says that said that um, Tesla was going to do a debt raise, so a corporate debt raise. So what they would do is sell corporate bonds, so IOUs. And what then happened over a succession of a couple of weeks, I think, I can't remember what the original um, original number was, but he said, well, I'm going to raise a bunch of money um, and that's it. And then what happened into mid-February is that Tesla went, ah, okay, we've hit our quota. What we're going to do now is actually we're going to keep on raising more. And I think, I can't remember the, the exact figure, but they, they raised an extra $2 billion, or I think it was a bit more than that. Offering two billion to yeah, then it was two point seven billion, and then I think it topped out around three billion. I can't remember. Um, and and everyone's like, well, Elon, you said you don't need the money. Why are you raising even more, like way more than you than you originally wanted? And he was like, oh, I just wanted to beef up the the balance sheet. I think this is pure masterclass in forward thinking. Now <clears throat> it's a bit like Jeff Bezos selling off a shitload of Amazon stock in January and February. And a few other big billionaires were selling off stock in big amounts. And I think, okay, so this is, I'm moving away from fact now, this is Siam opinion hat on moment here. Um, I think all these big billionaires, they obviously have the world's best access to information. They have the world's cleverest people working for them. And it doesn't take much to think that a lot of their advisors were probably looking at what was happening and unfolding in China and South Korea with, with COVID-19 and going, yeah, this is this is probably most likely going to spill over and it's going to affect everything. And if we do potentially have lockdowns like in China or South Korea, it's going to hurt, blah, blah, blah. So I think they were doing is Bezos sold off shitloads of stock because he saw that coming. So he was like, right, I need to crystallize some of this um, <clears throat> increased amount of share price and Elon did it did the other way he basically went oh, okay I'm gonna raise shit loads of money so when the lockdowns happen or when the shit if the shit hits the fan we got shit loads of cash so I think that's what happened so some of the big smart businesses they either sold stock or raised capital um, and this this is what happens in, in big shocks everyone with me so far yeah, yeah. cool right then we move on to so past the shock we then move into the reactionary phase, or what I call the reactionary phase. Um, so what happens is that we have a sharp sell-off, <clears throat> and if you look at the S&P 500, it dropped something like 39% in literally days. And then you have aggressive pullbacks as it plummets. So this is as it's still going down, but having big old plum um, pullbacks. And then you get knee-jerk stimulus, <clears throat> you then have a relief rally or a stim pump, stimulus pump, um, where this relief rally will go 30 to 70% retrace. At the moment, we're looking, we're hovering around sort of the 40 to 50% retrace level. But normally, when you look at most sharp crashes like this, it pulls back 50% before rolling over. Market rolls over, panic ensues. And big companies go into administration. Like, I mean, Debenhams have just gone into administration. It's nuts. You like, I mean, Debenhams have been around for donkey's years. But come to think of it, it makes sense. No one's shopping, <laughs> um, and they have massive overheads. So, it doesn't make it doesn't yeah. Um, more stimulus will come. This is the only real thing. This is the only real known entity here. There is more stimulus to come, folks like it's guaranteed 
as things get worse, more stimulus will come. I promise you that. Um, if you could go long in that, that would be great. How do you go long in that knowledge? Harder than it sounds. Can't just go long on stocks, not all the time. So here's what the narrative is. So the government <clears throat> says no need to panic, everything's fine, nothing to see here. Um, we'll have an important cabinet meeting just in case. Um, <clears throat> mainstream media, yeah, what they said. Social media. So this is where you see, uh, you know, the market has had the biggest gains in history. Um, and here's our in-house expert sharing his top stock picks. Like you see that all the time. Like. I constantly see news feeds like that. In fact, one second, if I go into, if I scroll back a bit, this is my own personal profile. Jeez, I post more than I think. Um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, no. If I don't find this soon, I'm going to index. No, 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 no. Oh, I can't find it. Three, two, one. No. Okay, can't find it. Anyway, before we had, like, when <clears throat> we're getting near the lows, I said, watch for the news because the news is going to be saying oh we had the biggest boom in history and then we and then that's what we we had i think the footy did the second biggest ever daily growth ever <laughs> um very soon after that but yeah so that's what happens the public carry on as usual they still don't know what's going on and then some of them start even buying stock because they're listening to all these stupid news pundits going oh yeah it's dropped 50 percent almost let's time to buy um <clears throat> And this is where the alternate media, alternative media go, right, this is the big one, and they go super bearish. So a good example of alternative media would be Zero Hedge. For those of you not familiar with Zero Hedge, it's this website. So it's basically permeable. You have to be you have to understand that with Zero Hedge, you'll find some good information here, but it's always bearish. Has been for the last 15 years, or however long it's been. Um so yeah, so stuff like that. However, yeah, there are you have to pick out the sensationalized stuff, but there is there is very good data in in here. <clears throat> so that's that markets. Yeah, big dump, relief rally as I said up here. Choppy price action causing uncertainty. So what's happening right now is I guess we're having a b the beginning of I guess choppy choppy price action which is causing uncertainty because we don't have a fucking clue what's going on. Like, as in traders, we do not know whether the market's going to go to all-time highs or it's going to roll over like it normally does. And the reason why it's causing uncertainty is because, you know, of the notion of you don't fight the Fed. We know for a fact stimulus is, is incoming or it's already incoming. We know it's only going to increase. So with the knowledge that the Fed will always do whatever it takes to prop up the markets, they're buying, they're buying everything right now like one part of your trader brain should be saying well you need to go long on markets but then the other part of your brain more of the fundamental analysis is going yeah well the world has basically just been kneecapped and it's on its knees like we we should see it falling over so that's the uncertainty and that's the battle i battle with in, in myself <clears throat> um Small businesses start downsizing on pruning. Biz, biz, yeah, big businesses, their overheads are huge, so they, they're, they're slower to react sometimes. Um, I still, I came across um, an article where there are some big businesses that still haven't furloughed their staff, and they're only just starting to furlough them. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, the time to react was the second that the government said, we're announcing the furloughing scheme, the job retention scheme. That is the time to react and do it. So you have the full, you know, full effect of the, that furloughing scheme, not, you know, a month before they're going to end it. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, revenue plummets because no one's out. Consumers start to get hit. Cash rich, but start laying off some of them. But yeah, basically all the big businesses, they're, they're now trying to protect their, their cash runway. They've got a basically they have big monthly outgoings and so they, they need to protect that. So that's the reactionary phase. And this is where we are right now. We are right in the middle of the reactionary phase. 
<clears throat> and we don't know how far. So the question I, I do not know is how far the stim pump will go. Now, for most, for, I mean, I, I don't really care, to be honest, because if we look at the S&P 500, whoops, wrong one, it's down here. So as you know, I'm trading the S&P, uh, sorry, the, the Dow Jones, US 30. Um, on the left hand is the daily chart, as you can see, bit of a mess because of my squiggles. Um, I don't really care how far this goes because I'm trading this on the lower time frames. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm nursing a really stupid short down here, but I don't really care because on the lower time frames, I'm just trading the trend. So if it starts trending upwards, I'll start going long. So the other day I was long, I made, I can't remember how much I made, but it's quite a lot um, in the thousands. And then it started rolling over. So yesterday, what I do? I started shorting it. I'm not fast. So I, I ended yesterday about eight grand up in profit just from these three shorts. So if you if you look at this, um, so I, I we'll talk about the 8 DMA bounce and trail later, but <clears throat> I was basically, that was a poor entry, but I still got in there and that's still riding it down. I then got in again here on this little low ball that pinged in nicely. Um, so actually this one triggered first, sorry. I had a low ball in that didn't hit trigger. I put a trigger here just on the 8 EMA and it pipped in beautifully, went in my favor and then it started going against, but the low ball triggered. But my stops at this point were above the 21 EMA. So I wasn't fussed and then it's rolled over again. And now um, I would have, so I would have actually put in another trend, a trade here, but it was a Friday night and I didn't want to place new trades because um, <clears throat> Sunday or Monday is going to be, it could spike either way. So what I've done with all of these stops is I've just placed my stops. I, I basically put it way, way down here. I've locked in all that profit there. And the reason I put it here is because there could potentially be some sort of bearish rectangle here. So I want to give it enough space in case it tries to fake out because there's a two a big old 800 level here. But yeah, if you look at these trades, so duh, 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 duh. there we go. Oopsie. So those three trades, as you can see, that, that long, that short is currently 27 grand down. I'm, yeah, I'm not too fussed about that because I've made probably as much as it's gone up and down. So that <clears throat> that first trade is five grand up. This one's 1300 quid up and this one's a grand up. So like I've covered all of those losses in the, in the ups and downs of the, as it, as it goes. So as a trader, a really good thing to, to memorize is that you should not worry about which direction the market's gonna go in. You need to worry about your reaction to the market. Okay, please remember that. <clears throat> Do not worry about what direction the market is going in. Worry about your reaction to the market. So for me, I'm trying to manage my own reaction to the market. And the way that I'm trying to do it is to not really give a shit. I don't care whether we go up another 10% or down another 10%. I don't care. I am going to manage my reaction to the market. And the way that I am managing my reaction to the market is simply I'm going to trade the trend on the lower time frames. So for me, I'm just going to stick to, hey, someone's doodling. Um, uh, get rid of the doodles. Where is it? Annotate. Clear all drawings. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm simply just going to trade the one hour time frame. And when it starts trending up, I'll just do the eight EMA bounce. When it starts going down, I'll just do the eight EMA bounce. And I'll just keep on doing this up and down, up and down until we finally roll over. And then when it rolls over, I'll just do exactly the same. I'm not going to do anything different. In, instead of like here, we've had a, a short, a very small retrace. I mean, if you look at this on the four hour chart, it's not really that much of a move compared to, you know, the whole stim bump. It's actually a tiny move here. But if I've managed to get three trades in on this small little move here, if this is the proper pump down, I'm going to get 10, 20 more trades as it, as it makes its way down, all the way down here. So, um, yeah, uh, just quickly, Alex, yes, I agree. The, the, the rollover will be very fast when it finally kicks in. 
Um, it will be as fast, sorry, as this falling that we saw on the way down. Um, and just very quickly, you see these big old, this rally here, this, um, this two and a half thousand point rally and this 1500 point rally. That is what I mean by um, aggressive, in this bit here, aggressive pullbacks as it plummets. That's what I mean there. Okay, everyone happy with, with the reaction phase so far? Alex, yeah, I will trade puppet when I do it. <clears throat> yeah. um, Chris Barrows, will I telegram these trades? Mm, uh, maybe. It's, it's tough. Thing is, there's, there's a risk that I could do damage by texting out my one hour eight EMA trades. Um, because if you don't react to them, you'll probably get in. Because what, what typically happens is I'll po post, hey, I'm, you know, I've, I've just gone short, blah, blah, blah. And then someone will read it an hour later that may not do any due diligence and then just go short at market and not even look at the price or when I was getting in. So I don't know, I may do it, but with extreme warning. Um, I was putting it in the group here. So all yesterday, I was posting screenshots and when I was getting in. So there's loads of screenshots as I was going in and out of stuff. But yeah, I may have to be, um, yeah. So let's get back to the presentation and we'll have a break at some point. So that's the reactionary phase. Um, yeah, so let's move on to the deflationary scare. So when we have the rolling over and the market, as in it's definitely the end of the stim pump. So look at the daily chart here, as it rolls over and it starts working its way down here, um, and it, or on its way down here is the beginning of the deflationary scare. But when we cl close, break and close below these this low here, that we're definitely 100% well and truly in the in the in the scare phase here. Because what may happen is that it'll punch through here, maybe, it, it then probably pull back, and then just carry on doing its dead cat bounce all the way down. So. After the reactionary phase, we then enter the deflationary scare. So, this is, I think, the big thing to note here is that consumer habits change. I've got a friend who's an airline pilot who is, who I guess is, I wouldn't say obsessed, but he's really keen to buy travel stock. Um, in fact, I've got two close friends. I don't know why, but I've got two, what, like one of my best mates and another old best, um, like Air Force mate. They're both really keen on buying travel stocks right now. And I just, I can't understand why. I've tried my hardest to explain what's going on, but I, I just think, like for example, Thomas Cook supposedly has had record sales for 2021. Um, and so a lot of people hearing data like that goes, oh, Tom, the CEO has just announced that, you know, they got record sales for, for holidays and flights and whatever, 2021. Oh yeah, let's buy stock to try and anticipate that. But you have to understand, sales in the travel industry doesn't mean money coming in. I can book a flight, you know, I could book a first class flight for 10 people to Abu Dhabi in 2022. What's it gonna cost me? Not much, a little deposit. You don't pay the full amount. Like I, I was supposed to go to Disney World in, in Florida in June. That was a big expensive holiday. We, what, was, what has it cost us so far? Just the deposit. Um, shit, I need to cancel that. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the, yeah, so I, yeah, so Alex, uh, the pilots understand planes, airports, for them these prices are a bargain, not more, they're not macroeconomists. Econom yeah, true. Um, yeah, so you have to understand that you will hear stuff like that, like, Everyone, like BA's pruning, everyone's doing that. And you will see at some point in the news, uh, record sales for airlines, cruise ships, blah, 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 for 2020, 2022. Um, what I'm trying to say is that those sales will evaporate. They will well and truly evaporate and be canceled and refunded or whatever when we enter the deflationary scare. Because what's gonna happen, if it hasn't already happened right now, is that people's consumer habits are changing and will change. 
So right now, we've been taught from the day we're born, maybe, um, that it's good to have a rainy day fund, right? That's something that everyone has heard from day one, you know, have a rainy day fund, have three months worth of savings, have six months, a year, whatever. Everyone knows it's common sense to have a rainy day fund. What is the percentage of people that actually have a decent rainy day fund, like zilch? Um, <clears throat> no one does. And the stats just show that. I mean, like hell, the UK spends 150% of what it earns. Um, like we're great spenders, like we're not great savers. But we've had a massive shock recently and a lot of people are going, oh shit, I got caught out with my pants down um, with this recent shock. Um, perhaps it's time to downsize, prune, not upgrade the car. Let's not have that nice holiday. Let's actually try and get, you know, five, 10, 20 grand in savings behind us just in case something bad happens. I think a lot of people are gonna do that. Now, <clears throat> in this Zoom call, how many are there? There's what, 81 people here. There's gonna be a bit, bit of a mix. You guys are a bit different. You, you are not the general public, just so, in, so we know. In this group, there's probably, I mean, technically speaking, there's, it's 50-50 in this, in this group. 50% of you are business owners, 50% um, aren't, but you're, you have entrepreneurial aspirations. Hell, the reason you're here is because you want to grow. Um, so it's always bearing in mind that groups like this is a bit bit of an echo chamber okay you have to be well aware of echo chambers um <clears throat> so yeah the realistic trader group it will be an echo chamber that we're all trying to short stuff we think things are going down blah 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 but it is also very prudent to have be aware of other points of view etc now but the thing is when it comes to the economy it's not us it's the 95 percent of people that yeah i guess it's the 95 percent is really what you need to worry about and the 95 percent i would say are the lower class and the the middle class i guess i guess you, most of us here are middle middle class i don't know what the pc term for lower class is working class i don't know um i'll just keep it to lot airlines airlines you have, used to have upper class middle class and lower class so i'll just yeah, <clears throat> I'm not non-political. I, I don't mean bad if I say lower class. I just don't know what the term is. So, <clears throat> so 90, 95% of the, of the population in the UK or the world is lower class. Um, and yeah, to, to a degree, lower middle class. So everyone's habits have changed. They're, they're shocked. People are becoming or will become savers. They will try and m insulate themselves now. Um, so people will, will be cancelling holidays. They won't be spending that much. Car sales are screwed. Um, anything luxury. Luxury sales will go up for the elite and the rich. Um, and they're going down for, um, I guess, the masses. Like for us, like I'm in a rented accommodation right now. Um, like, I... And we're bored. Or no, the, the family are bored as a whole. So what we've done is that we've increased are spending on stuff that we'd never really spent before. Like we bought like a big climbing frame thing that I had to build. Like we bought a swimming pool, um, like a, not a full, you know, hundred grand jobby type thing. We just bought a small swimming pool. Like, so stuff like that, sales are going up. Oh, dinosaur suit, yeah, bought that. Um, I bought a teapot, but the aperture was too big. I need to buy another teapot. So yeah, um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, everyone's different, but it's the masses that you need to worry about. So if you're in any investment groups, not just RT, be aware of that echo chamber effect. So as a result of, um, <laughs> Brad, it's the beard, not the aperture. No, it was the aperture. The teapot aperture was like that big. I couldn't literally, I had to, I couldn't, my, my eyes were touching the rim. <laughs> so yeah, the tea, I needed a small aperture. So. Yeah, so what happens when people start saving and then they reduce their spending, even by a little bit, like if every family reduces their spending by, hey, a hundred pounds a month, um, like that's a big knock on effect when there's 70 million families or 69 million families in, in the, I don't know, 66 million families of people in, in the UK. Um, <clears throat> so what happens is that currency velocity diminishes and that's the big thing. That is basically GDP. Um, like for example, there's 81 people in this group right now. If I start off with one pound and I, and I bought something from 
So I'm looking at my list here. On the, on the right of my ugly face is cash. If I bought something from him for a quid, uh, the group GDP is now one pound. If Cash then sold something to Joy, then to Eddie, then to Paul, then to Stephen, then to Joe, to Cam, to all of us, effectively, there's only one pound in circulation, but there's been not 81 transactions. So the GDP in this group will be 81 pounds. Now, if all of us start reducing the, our transaction amounts and transaction frequency, our currency velocity diminishes and so our GDP diminishes. Um, so it's bad. It's bad. We've just had Q1 and earnings, and I think the global economy shrunk by was it five or ten percent, whatever. It's going to be a, like a, just wait for Q2. Jesus, it's it's going to be horrendous. Um, so maybe I, I'm seeing maybe Q2, Q3 is when we enter the deflationary scare. Mass stimulus, buy up all debt, <laughs> including jump bonds that prop everything up. They're doing that already. Bankers get their bonuses. And that's the crazy thing with stimulus. It goes straight into the banking sector. Um, it rewards the bankers as in people on, uh, you know, their, uh, on stock options, etc. Yeah, there'll be a public outcry. <clears throat> Central banks will buy stocks, like physically. At the moment, they're not. They're doing it via proxies. Um, GDP will keep falling. Velocity freezing. Barely flowing. Yeah. They'll, they'll probably do some tax deference. So they're already doing it in the UK somewhat. So um, <clears throat> like I think the VAT payments are being deferred, not wiped out, they're just being pushed back. And that's what happens. So they may say, right, you don't have to pay your income tax and CGT for the next two years or whatever. You still owe it. It's just they're pushing it back, stuff like that. Or they may get crazy and go, right, here's every tax rebate you've ever paid as a check. Or something like that. So that could create a short-term equity rally, but there'll be nothing in the grand scheme of things. Um, now here's the thing: <clears throat> because people, because currency velocity slows down and everyone starts saving, price inflation doesn't hit the economy. So they can then print as much as they want, but if that's not entering the economy and it doesn't stimulate spending, price inflation doesn't grow. See, th this is the weird thing that happened in the the in many hyperinflations, especially let's say the, the Weimar Republic hyperinflation, they were doing ridiculous hyperinflation. Um, but it wasn't hitting the economy. Everyone was storing it under their mattresses. Um, <clears throat> and because the, the money pumping wasn't stimulating the economy, because everyone was putting it in the mattress, they then increased the spending. They increased it, increased it, increased it. And so all it does is it builds a massive price inflation bomb. And then eventually what happens is people get to the point where, ah, yes, I finally saved up 12 months worth of earnings. Um, I feel quite safe now. Um, and once everyone gets that tipping point going, yeah, I've now got a rainy day fund, let's start spending. What happens? Everyone starts spending. That's when you'll see, you know, yeah. And that's when that, you know, you open the floodgates to that price inflation bomb. And all of a sudden, you thought you had 12 months worth of rainy day fund, but now that price inflation or that, 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 that stimulus is now entering the economy en masse, price inflation rockets up. So all of a sudden, ah oh shit, your 12 months worth of rainy day funds won't buy you a potato. Um, so, and that's when really bad things happen. So yeah, um, and I think it could be quite, I think we could enter a situation where people en masse Maybe, you know, as they bail out the bankers again, people go, well, screw this. I'm not paying my mortgage. Screw you, government. I'm not paying my rent. Or people just stop paying their rent like they're doing right now. People don't pay their rent. The mortgages don't get paid. So long story short, loads of mortgage um, defaults and um, <clears throat> refused payments will ha happen. Um, I guess, yeah, mortgage, as in people letting out houses, they go, well, shit, all my tenants aren't paying me, so I'm, I'm forced to not pay my mortgage. I, don't, I can't pay it. So, yeah, and people will just keep money for necessities. So when the price inflation bomb explodes and, you know, prices for everything goes up, um, people will pay, spend on just necessities. Um, yeah, people start to resent and blame the government and actions will show that. This is where you see riots, by the way. Um, yeah, so, and here's the thing. Here's, here's, here's a multi-thousand year um, stat, which I find fascinating. Nearly 
every time a country where they've had money problems and it takes 40% of a family's wages or income to, so so let me rephrase that. When, a, when the average family has to spend 40% of their income on food, that's when you see civil riots. We saw it in Egypt very recently, a few years ago, <clears throat> and every other country. 40% is the, is the key thing. So when 40% of the UK nations or America, let's say America really, of American citizens, when 40% when of their income goes on to food alone, we will see mass riots. We'll see civil war, mass riots, military in the streets, um, military killing civilians to try, you know, it's all that sort of stuff. That's when you see crazy shit happening. Yeah, reality sinks in, people will flurry spend on necessities, in price inflation kicks in. And this is what the narrative is, you know. <clears throat> the government will say, we're doing everything in our power to solve it. This came out of nowhere. We could not have predicted this. Really? Uh, mainstream media will be divided. Some will be pro-government, some won't be. Social media, the world is ending. Public, slightly more aware. Lower class won't care or know as they won't have market exposure. As I said, the lower class don't buy stocks, so they don't really give a shit if the stock market's crumbling. Um, the middle class are getting wiped out. The upper class are getting creamed. Uh, and the elite make a fortune. Remember, a lot of the upper class, they have all of their uh, money and property, bonds, stocks as well. Um, but it's, yeah, so they get, they'll get wiped out as well. So basically, middle class turns into lower class. Everyone turns into lower class, pretty much. And the elite gets richer. Um, alternative media will be focused on scandals galore. There'll be all sorts of scandals going on. <clears throat> like the tech bubble collapse in 2000, 2001. I mean, we had the Enron scandal back then, um, and we had 9-11. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on, but yeah. Markets, vertically down, yeah. So remember those few hours when oil went from like $10 to zero, or minus 37, and it was just relentless. I remember I was trying to put the, the kids in the bath. I was like trying to bathe them and had my phone with oil <laughs> going nuts. And I was like, oh, I need to go to trade. But yeah, so during all that happening, I was putting the kids in the bath. It wasn't safe, not for my account or for them. <laughs> um, and I didn't want them to drown. So so <clears throat> it was, yeah. Um, so that price action is oil was relentlessly going down beyond belief, beyond expectations. Um, that is what the stock markets will look like. And it'll be like, Jesus, it cannot go any further down. Um, small businesses will be lying face down in the water, um, like they already are right now. Um, biz big businesses, some will be booming, like Zoom. We're in Zoom right now. They're booming. Um, Netflix, booming. But most will be hurting or dying. So that's the deflationary scare. We'll have a break after this, by the way. We're almost near the end of this bit. Um, everyone with me? Everyone following the deflationary scare bit okay so far oh yes here we go alex is oh, i thought you're being serious but you're being facetious yeah here's the thing that i see all of the time <clears throat> but the fact is well known surely western governments won't allow it to get to that <laughs> yeah interesting so cool you're with me good still there lovely so, <clears throat> yeah, they said that about COVID-19. Now look what's happened. They wouldn't let it get to, you know, this. Well, yeah. Anyway, so that's the deflationary scare. And this is when we enter the next phase, which is, ah, shit, not the deflationary scare. Oh, no. I've copied the wrong freaking screenshot. One sec, I can open this up in my Google Doc. Hopefully it's saved. Crash notes. Please say it's saved. Please, please, please. Here we go. Big, let's just, sniping tool. Snipe or snip. Let's go back to the whiteboard. Reaction, deflationary scare. We can delete that one. Oh, apparently I can't delete it. Oh well, let's just look at it over here. So here we have, <clears throat> if I zoom in a bit, 
So we, we now have the big inflationary outcome bit. So Argentina and Venezuela um, are classic modern day examples of this happening um, when they enter big inflationary outcomes. So if you want to know really what happens, just look at what, what's happened in the last two years in Venezuela. Literally, just type in something like Venezuela inflation timeline. Um, there will be all sorts of articles and it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. Um, <clears throat> countries will panic dump the dollar eventually. So at the moment, the, the Federal Reserve is trying to dollarize the world. They're trying to pump dollars out there because um, everyone's stopping using the dollar. I mean, the, the Chinese aren't using him. Oil um, oil consumption is falling off a cliff, which, meant, which means that because we're in the petrodollar system, there is a less a lack of a requirement of US dollars at the moment. Um, so they're trying to dollarize the world. Eventually, um, and so what ha what's happening is that everyone's dollar accounts is growing. It's a bit like, you know, they're saving dollars, they're not spending them. So eventually it's going to get to the point where countries themselves will start spending the dollar. Well, no, when countries start seeing that the dollar is going to experience deflation or, or big inflation, they'll go, oh shit, I need to get rid of these dollars before the purchasing power of these dollars gets inflated away, um, before big inflation comes in. So what we may ha ha happen, see, is that countries just start selling the dollar like wildfire. Remember, China has like four trillion dollars worth of US denominated assets. Like they'll probably try and offload them. Like, yeah. And so what will happen is that the dollars will be flooding back to the US, which will trigger big inflation, um, <clears throat> as well as the public starting to, to spill over, uh, start spending. Yeah, I uh, mentioned the food bit. Yeah, and so this point here, the government may enforce a bank holiday and during this bank holiday it, it could take two weeks like don't be surprised to see a week or two week bank holiday where everything is frozen so just like with on FXCM where oil has gone nuts and we can't short oil anymore we can't short the ESP 35 and we can't short the French CAC um, the governments have done this before on other things. Like when in 1980, silver went nuts. It went from $3 to $50 pretty quickly. And what happened at $50? They put a cap on it. No more buy orders allowed on silver, only sell orders allowed. So the government does this all the time. This is not a new thing, um, traders. They, they do this. So what will happen, <clears throat> what's likely to happen if a massive nation like the UK or US or China or Russia, or whatever, has big inflation like this. Let's set, let, let's stick with the US. They'll just do right bank holiday. Everything's frozen. So, as part of that, there'll be capital controls. So they'll freeze your accounts. There may, I'm not sure about bail-ins. I thought there would be bail-ins of it, you know, eventually. But now I think about about it. I I don't think there will be bail-ins. I'm not sure. I'm, I can argue both sides equally at the moment, so I'm still thinking about that. But I think a bank holiday will happen. One to two weeks, where they'll, well, they'll, they'll pause everything, they'll come up and they'll try and reset. They'll do a monetary reset of some sort. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the government will probably be trying to keep the crowd on side. Um, we'll do what's right for the people. We're trying to figure out a debt jubilee. A debt jubilee is as old as they come. Like for thousands of years, governments and countries have done debt jubilees. Um, which is basically they're going to wipe out debt of some sort um, and they'll probably do whatever just enough to keep the population happy um, <clears throat> I mean one way to really really appease everyone is to wipe out everyone's mortgage imagine the popularity that Boris Johnson would get if he went right everyone's mortgage is now zero <laughs> like he, he, he could do that. Like, they could. They could wipe out whatever billions of pounds debt that is. They could just wipe it out. They could. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, anyway. Um, I need to stop being distracted by the chat box. I need to get through the content first. <clears throat> so, yeah, they could do that. So, yeah, mainstream media, yeah, come on socialism. Uh, <laughs> I still find it ironic that modern day crony capitalism is bailed out by socialism every decade um, social media will be focused on some sort of scandal public calling for a debt jubilee and ubi honestly 
if anything was going to instigate UBI quicker than everything, like it's now, like there will be a, a horrific war on cash. They'll say that cash transmits the bloody coronavirus 10 times more than whatever. They'll get rid of cash using corona as its scapegoat. <clears throat> um, we'll have an electronic pound sterling. The government will issue an e-wallet. They'll let the banks go bust. I, I really do see one of the big banks, Barclays, HSBC, BC, Santander, one of the big you know banks going bust. And I think most of the banks will actually go bust. This is my crazy, crazy Syme opinion hat on. I see mainstream banks going bust, and I think the government will let them go bust. And I think the UK government will force this, the Bank of England, so our central bank, to become the retail bank. Um, and what will probably happen is that companies like Revolut, Tide, and all of these fintech companies, which are already starting to take market share away from the banks, they will <clears throat> they will jump in. So I think they'll probably mainstream banks will get skin dry. Um, Revolut and stuff like that will go big, and they'll have like some sort of API into the, so. Revolut or whoever it may may be will be the front user end the, the 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 user end the front end of the whole banking sector, and the central bank will be I guess the bank um, <clears throat> and where all the, the the machine cogs are going. So yeah, I think, and what they'll do is they'll you know if you've got ten grand in your Barclays account, and Barclays go bust, they'll go right yeah um, you've lost your ten grand in Barclays. However. Here is your new e-wallet, um, and as long as you're vaccinated, you can have access to ten grand in this new e ten grand in this new e-wallet. Like, there's going to be a give and take here. There's going to be massive give. Like, here's UBI. Everyone's allowed, I know, a thousand pounds per month, regardless of who you are, what you do. But in order to have this UBI to get on the UBI system, you need to be vaccinated. You need to be, I don't know they'll force something on us okay so just be aware of that so when they do finally give out a debt jubilee and or a ubi just try and research of what they're taking from you as well it will be a given to take then so um where are we scandals global blah, blah, blah. big spikes down initially but then yeah it's this bit this will be the start of a 10-year boom so this will be the equivalent of 2009 or 2002. And this is where non-inflationary assets will moon like never before. Remember, at this point, we would, we would have had trillions of dollars and pounds of stimulus, which hasn't hit anything, you know, because, you know, the currency velocity has gone to zero. When that floodgate opens and, every, and we see big inflation, what do you think Bitcoin's going to do? What do you think Monero is going to do when they start doing capital controls? Cryptos will go nuts, literally. Just think of it. There's there's, there's a finite supply of Bitcoin, especially with the halvening, um, or cryptos in general. There's a finite supply. Ether is turning into more of a finite supply. Now it's going from proof of state to uh, proof of work to proof of state. Uh, actually, no. Ignore me on that. But yeah, let's just take Bitcoin. So the... There's a finite supply. And if Bitcoin is, you know, <clears throat> $8,000 at this currency supply, what if the US prints 10 trillion more dollars over the next year or two? That has to go somewhere. Even a tiny bit is going to push Bitcoin up. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's why I'm hesitating about Ether. There's a bit, yeah, it's a bit iffy, Ether. But, um, yeah, so non-inflationary non assets will boom. Crypto is the main one. <clears throat> I can't see land booming too much, but I do want land. I really do. Um, my goal is I, I, I would really like at least 500 acres in the UK and a lot of acres in another country somewhere. <clears throat> so me personally, I know this sounds proper cuckoo, but I want shitloads of land in the UK with my own hangar and a, a multi-country capable aircraft. So personally, like it doesn't. I don't need necessarily a private jet. Like you can get a Beach King Air. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going off on one. Basically, I want the ability to take off from my garden and fly to another country, somewhere, Switzerland or Namibia. 
<laughs> and then later to New Zealand. Um, so it may need to be bigger than a King Air. But yeah, that, that's my goal. Um, I see. I, I really see bad, bad things happening, and I want to be able to bang out if I need to. So small businesses start to open, reopen, or pivot. Um, <clears throat> They're already doing that somewhat, but when you know there's the light at the end of the tunnel, the market's starting to open a bit. Um, you know, yeah, businesses will start to open. As I, as I said, it's going to be like 2002 or and 2009, where you know it's the end of the crash. All time lows are in um, now. Now prosperous journey. Um, and then here's the crazy thing: I think a lot of big names are going to crumble, and in their place, some new trillion dollar businesses will be born. I, I see that um, there will be several and I, I reckon there'll be a trillion dollar business I, I, no I reckon there'll be two or three trillion dollar businesses per exponential tech that's my prediction I see one of the most prosperous times in history coming over the next 10 years no 10 years after the big inflationary outcome so 10 years after the, the resetting Whenever, however, I don't know how long this is going to take. Um, this could take two years. I mean, on average, the crashes last about 18 months. <clears throat> so let's say it takes a year because things are moving faster. Let's say this could be a year crash, but it'll be a lot deeper than we think. Um, once we reset, I think 10 years from then will be so unbelievable, unbelievably prosperous. We've got 11, 11 exponential technologies. Um, and I see two or three trillion dollar businesses in each tech. So let's just take 3D printing. There's going to be three, like if you look at any niche, any niche whatsoever, there's always two to four big boys, aren't there? Look at, you know, um, online meeting things. We've got Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts. I think they're the three big ones. What about online streaming? <clears throat> We've got Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney. Um, internet browsers we've got what was it Google Yahoo DuckDuckGo I don't know <laughs> um, every industry or niche has three big boys pretty much um, Apple Android yeah so I th yeah I, I see and imagine that 11 so 33 businesses that become trillion dollar businesses what do you think the stock market's going to do I think it's going to be ridiculous ridiculous booming coming so there is a silver lining to all of this. You just need to step out, step aside. Like literally, just don't worry. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Here's the insidious result. The elite will still have control after all of this, especially if they do a jet, debt jubilee. They may just knock off nine zeros, but they'll still control everything. Um, they'll have more control. Uh, it will be more sophisticated. Remember, as time progresses, um, <clears throat> people get more sophisticated. Um, in fact, I had a fascinating chat about religion with someone and someone was saying how, so this person was a bit close minded in my opinion, and he was saying, oh, those Islamic people, they're barbarians, they're, you know, all they're doing is they're blowing people up and blah, 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 they're savages. And I was like, mm, okay, so you're Christian, aren't you? Do you know much about Christianity around, I don't know, the 10 hundreds? <laughs> um, I mean, hell, just look at what Christians did from you know, from the Romans until, you know, 200 years ago, Christians were savages. Um, and so you could say some religions may be just a bit backward, you know, and it's always a small group. Sorry, let's get away from religion before everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so moving on before I open up a massive can of worms. So, <clears throat> Yeah, things will get more sophisticated. Um, all civil liberties will have vanished. Vanished. I like honestly. Yeah, we're focusing on markets and stuff, but I think the real threat here is civil liberties. I genuinely do see um, microchip implants in all of us. I really do. like like in your dog, in your pet dog, like Pips downstairs. Pips has a microchip in her neck somewhere. Except our microchip will be our e-wallet. It'll be our ontology style. ID, your medical records will be on there, your bus pass, your everything, NFC, anything NFC capable will be on it, um, and your UBI, yeah, that's the only way you can get it, 
Hell, they may even make it that you have to go somewhere to wave your hand to collect your UBI. <laughs> um, so this is where a lot of people start to disagree with where my thinking gets, but that's what I, I think is gonna be horrible. And here's the thing, people think this is horrible, but all I would like you to do is just open your eyes and do research modern day life in China. Not the future, as in today. As in, it's what, <clears throat> Q1, Q2, no, Q2 2020. Have a look what the average middle class person in China has to live in and through and with right now. And you will be shocked. If anyone's watched Black Mirror, is that, you know Black Mirror Nosedive? Uh, Black Mirror, so Black Mirror Nosedive. So this one. Um, China isn't actually that far off <laughs> um, from this. China right now is, yeah, it's nuts. If your social credit rating isn't high enough, you're not allowed on buses or any public transport. You have to pay more for your utilities. You're, sometimes you're not even allowed to access the internet. And if you are, your, your bandwidth is throttled. You're not allowed certain jobs. You're not allowed in certain public areas or buildings. Um, and this is not conspiracy stuff. This is fact. This isn't today, right now. If you are low on the Chinese credit si uh, social system, you are banned from freaking everything. And this is where we're heading. <clears throat> and in China, you cannot live without a mobile phone. Like everything's connected to your mobile phone. Um, your your you get income. Your you do your dating, your insurance, your food, all from one app, WeChat. <laughs> um, you do like everything is from your mobile phone you cannot live there is no cash pretty much go to Shanghai go to Shenzhen go to anywhere and you will not be like there's most shops won't accept physical cash you have to pay via one of these apps um, so I promise you we like one of the best things you can do is research modern life China right now and you will be shocked because it's just a matter of time before America gets that way and then once America is that way the UK won't be far to follow um, except <clears throat> in China it's a lot easier to enforce people into a regime like that whereas in the developed world or the Western world let's say it'll take a lot longer so it may take 10 to 15 years to get to modern day China but we'll get there it's tracking there um, and yeah, effect effectively, this is the, the greatest transfer of wealth from the uninformed to the informed. So, um, it's been one hour and 52. Uh, <laughs> let's have a break. So what we're going to do, let's zoom out there. Uh, we will do a Q&A, but that is my big old presentation there. And then when we get back, we will talk about what's likely to happen next. Um, in fact, we've already talked about that. What's likely to happen next? Yeah, it's all this. We've, we've, we've done it. Cool, that's off the list. An essential reading is um, Creature from Jekyll Island, Currency Wars, Trilogy. I think it's actually a quadrilogy. Quad, what is a four? Quartet? <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, anything written by Jim Rickards, basically. He is the man. Um, so that's that. And then Confessions of an Economic Hitman like a central reading so that's that Let's zoom out and then what we're going to do is have what time is it now it's almost four let's have um is everyone happy with what a 20 minute break or 15 minute break what do you guys want <clears throat> 15 cool let's meet back here at quarter past four okay don't log off or anything because it'll be a ball late getting back on. I don't know. Um, I'm going to leave. All I'm going to do is just stop sharing my screen. Um, but then I'll be back here on the dot at quarter past four. Okay. Time to have a wee, get a drink. Quarter past four. See ya. Righty tighty. Um, stop sharing.